Hello, and welcome to my API The Docs talk. I'm Sarah Day, and I'm a career technical writer currently overseeing the product, API, and SDK documentation at LaunchDarkly, a startup of 180 people in Oakland, California. If you have questions that I don't address in this talk or in the Q&A after, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or get in my mentions on Twitter, where I am at ScribblingFox. Yeah, so the Launch Darkly slide template has speaker pictures in it, um, but my understanding is that you'll also be seeing a recording of my face. So hello, um, this is what I look like, although most of the time right now I tend to look more like this. There we go. Uh, hi, everyone. I hope everyone is as safe and minimally stressed out as you can be in these crazy days. Thank you for taking time out of unclogging your sinks and knitting sweaters out of the fur your dog sheds to attend my talk. So when they released the full speaker lineup for the series of online events that API the Docs has become in the wake of every conference in 2020 being canceled, I was a little surprised mine got accepted. This is not a talk about API Docs specifically, nor is it a highly technical talk. Uh, someone actually suggested the actual name for this talk should be how to make your company pay for technical writing projects, a talk by a technical writer. Yeah, strapped in. So let's talk for a minute about where I work. At LaunchDarkly, we make a product and API that provides fast, reliable feature management for companies of any size in any market. Software powers the world. LaunchDarkly empowers all teams to manage and control their software. I was hired as the company's first technical writer 300 years ago in 2019. Although our platform has grown to encompass a lot of use cases, LaunchDarkly began as a developer-facing tool. Like a lot of dev tools, our first point of contact, both with existing customers and with friends we haven't met yet, is often through our documentation website. And for a while there, our doc site was uh, fine, OK, functional, but not truly useful. Lots of doc sites look like this, right? You kind of hate to see it happen. There's plenty of good content and strong writing, but it's obscured by a poor search appliance and lackluster design and inscrutable feedback forms or liked and didn't like buttons with thumbs on them. Developer tools need accurate, reliable, usable documentation to appeal to a wide base of users. This talk is in part about how we took a mediocre documentation site and made it world class. But that's not all it is. This is not a tool chain talk. There are a lot of tool chain talks out there in the tech talk world, and you don't need another one from me. Nor is this a talk that's strictly about API docs or about writing APIs. This talk is intended to provide a template from which you can start making decisions about how to implement big changes to documentation sets and behavior at your company. We all have cool stuff we want to do at work. Humans are creative, we're innovative, and we're easily bored. We are a species of tinkerers. It's natural to see processes and tools in the world around us and scheme about how to make them better. If you're watching this talk, maybe you have an idea in mind, a thing you want to build, or a process you want to improve about your documentation. And without a plan to make that happen, nothing is going to change. And let's face it, no one gets promoted for having a cool idea. This talk is intended to provide a template from which you can start making decisions about how to implement big changes to documentation sets and behavior at your company. My hope is that by the end of this talk, you'll have a clear roadmap with useful decision points of how to scope, argue for, and implement changes in the documentation culture at your company. Along the way, I'll talk about the investments LaunchDarkly made in our documentation org and how they paid off. I'm going to tell you the story of how Launch Darkly rebuilt our documentation site. My intention is to help you brainstorm and structure the thing you want to accomplish so you have a practical, actionable plan that other people will take seriously. In every section of this talk, I'm going to ask you a series of questions that you can use as you start to plan out your big project. My hope is that the process of answering these questions for yourself tells you more about what you want to achieve at work and what you know and don't know about how to do it. Ready? Let's go. Documentation teams everywhere know the difficulty of being siloed. We sit in a liminal space in most organizations where we're writing about products, but with an eye to customer support. And our documentation is technical, but needs to be comprehensible by the least technical reader. We also have to be on top of new features, but spend time maintaining and ex uh, updating existing content. 
we're never just in one place. That's why it's really important when you start a new project to fully understand your team's relationship to the larger organization. So what do you know about the landscape you're working in? How do things get planned, built, and delivered at your company, and how can you use these workflows to your advantage? Launch Darkly was 100 people when I joined, with a documentation set of 110 or so topics hosted on a website published by a third-party service. The product organization at Launch Darkly uses the triad model to scope, design, and build new stuff. Every feature team consists of at least one designer, engineer, and a product manager, which makes for fast, coherent, de-siloed development. So do you have organizational support for the changes you want to make? If not, how can you get it? Who do you need to argue with, befriend, influence, or cajole? Are you positioned to make the changes that you want to make inside your org? Fortunately, my boss, the CTO, knew we needed a tools migration already when I joined, so I didn't have to make an argument for why investing company time in a great doc site was valuable. Without support from leadership, I would have had to make a much stronger argument for devoting development time to rebuilding our doc site from scratch. In addition, documentation is an engineering practice at LaunchDarkly, so I'm in the product delivery business unit and officially a one-person team in the engineering department. I'm a huge advocate for docs and engineering rather than supporter QA because the closer you are to the product you're writing about, the higher impact your contributions can be. If I had been part of the support team or writing a knowledge base based on QA findings, I would have had a much harder time understanding and advocating for how my project would fit into the feature development workflow we already had. Odds are you're going to be changing up your daily work to get this project done. This might be a small change like being unavailable for an hour a week while you take a class or a huge change like blocking out a month of working time to change from one tool to another. So do you have a plan for how the normal percentage of your workload is going to get done while you focus on this project? Do you know how to set or reset expectations about your work while the project goes on? I had done six months of work setting up processes to centralize and facilitate documentation efforts internally. We had a documentation space in our Confluence instance, a doc project with specific epics to deal with features, content improvements, IA, and so on. By the time we started the migration, people by and large knew how to get in touch with me and what our processes to create docs look like. Additionally, the engineering team had done a fantastic job of building the documentation set out before I got hired, and they were used to writing first draft product docs for others to review. That meant that during the site rebuild, I was able to step away from some of my documentation commitments temporarily to manage the content migration to the new site, and people weren't surprised or burdened by it. I strongly recommend that you make plans to accommodate your normal workload when you're scoping out your big project. If you don't, you're going to have a hard time in a month or two. Think tire fires. When you're scoping out your project and your daily work, this is time for a really serious gut check. Ask yourself, when you think about doing this project, do you actually know what you're talking about? Do you have a plan in mind with a clearly articulated goal? Or do you have a wish that something was different? Plans start from wishes, but they need substance to really get stuff done. I had done tools migrations at other companies before, and I was familiar with both the excitement and the tedium of porting a whole bunch of content to a new platform. This meant that I was able to scope accurately, especially the content migration. It meant that when I was able to weigh the impact and the challenges of different parts of the project against each other, I could also determine where we should invest our early efforts because we'd have to iterate, versus what was known, uncomplicated work that a less technical person like me could just slam out by spending a couple of weeks in front of a keyboard. Okay, so you've figured out the lay of the land. Now it's time to define your objectives. The trick to this section is to try to think about the stuff you haven't thought about yet as you formulate your plan. Who do you need to work with beyond the obvious candidates? What impact your project has beyond the scope of what you ship, et cetera? These factors have a big impact on what you end up building, and they can help keep you from building something that ends up annoying or not serving a lot of people later. So what do you want out of this project? What's going to look different at the end of it? How will you measure your outcomes after you ship? We were going to invest engineering, design, and PM time in rebuilding our doc site from scratch. In order to do that as nimbly as possible with a minimum of iteration and maximum respect for everyone's time, we had to have clearly identified goals. 
Tracking the impact of docs is notoriously tricky, but there are a couple of tried and true methods that we use. Google Analytics is, of course, a mainstay tool that we use to track traffic and engagement. And in the new site, we would be adding support for pull requests and feedback through GitHub. We didn't aim for specific numbers based on the changes that we made, but we knew improvements to the metrics we cared about would be a positive sign. And speaking of feedback, have you considered who's going to be impacted by the changes you want to make? Are you willing and able to invest non-documentation time in making improvements that help non-documentation people? Or is this something that the docs team or you by yourself can handle and deliver on your own? For us, it wasn't just about making a docs site that looked nicer for the general public. We also wanted to improve the writing experience for contributors to the docs. So rather than fussing around in a WYSIWYG editor, we adopted a more developer-friendly docs as code approach. Now all of our docs are written in Markdown, HTML, or MDX, and hosted on GitHub, which makes it fast and easy to update them. This meant, however, that we spent a big percentage of the 12 weeks we had allocated to the project building or implementing custom components for callouts, tables, code samples, and more. This was an engineering choice that we were happy to make, but it was also a huge time commitment. So consider the trade-off between helping folks outside your project and the time it's going to add. For us, it was worth it, but your math might be different. Speaking of other people, is your project internally focused or like an opportunity for relationship building and outreach and community development? Does your project make it easier to get input from non-doc stakeholders? Does it break down silos in the writing process or build them up? We wanted to build a community of docs contributors. Our existing docs site had a suggest edits button on every page, but clicking it prompted you to log into the service we use to host the site, which no one wanted to do. We had about five suggested edits per month, mostly from internal contributors. We wanted to give a much more developer friendly experience in our docs, so we decided to host them on GitHub and enable pull requests on every page. As you're building, do you need input from teams you don't usually work with, like designer marketing, to get your project really polished? How are you building your team? We wanted to take our docs from useful and functional to an argument of our brand's reliability and consistency. We were missing a big opportunity to convey the LaunchDarkly brand and our design choices. We also knew that we had to introduce a gap between draft content and publication. We built the site with the capability to stage and preview our changes locally so we didn't accidentally ship breaking changes to production, and so we could preview pre-release content in a PR-based staging site. This sounds like a small thing, but it was actually a huge win. The existing doc site had no way to preview changes before we published, so it was incredibly difficult to prep and review edits or new docs before we ship new features. This was a really big technical undertaking, but it was the bare minimum of functionality we wanted to have, so we made it happen. Which leads to my next question. What can you cut to ship your project as fast as possible? What is your absolute minimum set of success criteria? We wanted to make the site rebuild as fast and minimal as possible. We set an early design and engineering goal of nothing new. A rebuild of the features that we already had on the existing doc site would be enough. That said, we did sneak in a couple little UX improvements, like a date line that indicates when a page was last updated, an estimation of how long each page takes to read, and a change log. We got most of those for free by using native behavior or extensions that Gatsby supports, and I built and updated the change log myself. So at this point, I'm sure it's clear that there was no way I was doing this project by myself. We devoted a 12-week quarter to the docs site rebuild and decided on a triad model with supplemental people. Every role on the triad had a backup in case they needed extra hands or advice. But the project didn't stop with the triad. Our project was so much more than the people who were assigned to the team. So who do you absolutely need to get your project done? What is the bare minimum number of people required to make your vision not just a reality, but a success? Spoiler alert, it's probably more people than you think and more departments too. So we had a triad, a product manager, a designer, and an engineer, and that can do a lot. I acted as the product manager on this project with a lot of support and wisdom from my wonderful coworker Mira, PM extraordinaire. More on my role in a minute, but it didn't stop there. Marketing is not usually a department technical writers think of when it comes to making docs changes, but when it came time to ship the site, they helped us craft an announcement blog post and schedule it across all of LaunchDarkly's various online properties to make sure our project got maximum attention and distribution. 
Special recognition also goes to the DevOps team who helped us with the intricacies of getting the site up and running. We have two docs repos running in concert, one in private and one in public, with a bevy of integrations running on GitHub Actions to keep everything going. It's much more complicated than it looks from the outside, but from the outside, it looks seamless because of the DevOps team. So when you've assembled your probably larger than you thought group of people, who else is left? This is where you bring in the allies. Who are the wise elders of your company who can give you advice and feedback? And how can you plan to include them and iterate based on what they say? This group of people who I referred to as simply as friends of the docs, TM, uh, were, were opinionated stakeholders and interested third parties who advocated for the project before leadership. They also gave us feedback on our work at key intervals, helped us test various versions of the site, and helped us troubleshoot different attempts at solving problems. Speaking of helping out, what are your specific tasks to accomplish? What skills can you bring to the table to make your project a reality? Will you be doing things that you're already good at, or will you need to learn new things? This was my first time acting as a product manager, shipping a change that impacted the whole company and spanned across multiple departments. It was fun, it was a huge commitment, and it was at times really stressful. <laughs> Unlike a lot of technical writing, this was not a job where I could vanish into a research task for a week or two and come out with a beautifully crafted piece of documentation for my contributors to edit. Instead, I had to accurately plan and scope our work from week to week, to have strong, clear opinions about how our new components should work, and to have a vision in mind of what the final site should look like and how it should behave that I was still able to change based on the technical realities we discovered during development. People needed input on these things every day and often multiple times a day. It was a very big change from my daily experience as a technical writer and definitely up-leveled my communication, strategic, and stress management skills. Okay, so we had, we had assembled a team and had a good idea of what we wanted to build. So have you scoped your project accurately? Cool. Can you build it by throwing away 25% of what you've planned? Try that and see how that looks. It's better to deliver 100% of a reasonable project than 60% of an ambitious one. Look for opportunities to cut scope. We threw a bunch of stuff out. I went into this project with a bunch of beautiful dreams and new functionality I wanted to build, almost all of which we left broken on the side of the highway as we drove along following the roadmap. We agreed early in the project that our explicit goal was to rebuild the existing features on the dock site and not add anything new. I was disappointed initially, but this ended up being a great move. How can you de-silo yourself as you build? This is a common problem for docs teams, and it's especially important to account for it when you're the one leading a big project. If you're carrying information in your head or from your own expertise about how this project should look when it's done, what is the best way to communicate that to the rest of your team? My example is that the designers on our project hadn't ever designed a doc site before, so there was a great productive process of comparing the design elements we loved from best in show doc sites like Twilio and Algolia and considering how we could get them into our own designs. The wireframes they came up with then went through a formal design review process with the entire team, so everyone had confidence and input to how the final product this also helped me distribute some knowledge about how uh, effective visual information architecture can work in a documentation site. Have you planned for things to go terribly wrong? Do you have redundancies in place for when someone inevitably gets sick or goes on vacation or leaves the company? If you don't, do you know how long a smaller group will take to do the same amount of work? Plan and buffer your project to account for absences and hopefully you'll end up with time you don't use instead of going over time, which is what we did. I can't overstate how conservative you should be with how you estimate your time, seriously. I have anxiety about stuff like this and I thought I was being as meticulous as possible with my estimates, but we still went two weeks over budget. And why? Well, there were a few reasons. Uh, as the designs were being completed, the engineers started building the custom components we would need to replicate all of the text and visual elements on the new site. I consulted on that, but the majority of my work was devoted to the content migration, a meticulous process of retooling our original hosting platform's unique tagging language into Markdown and MDX. This was a pain, and it took weeks. Still, no problem. I guessed it would take about three weeks, and it did. Thank you, Universal Find and Replace. But partway through the process, I was knocked out by the flu. 
and then my laptop broke. And then half the team went on vacation for the winter holidays. Stuff like this is going to happen to your project. Give yourself a buffer for when things go unexpectedly, catastrophically wrong. We knew enough in advance to plan for less productivity over the winter break, but no one anticipates a broken laptop or a bad head cold or a global pandemic. Mm -mm. And speaking of planning effectively, how are you informing other stakeholders about the status of your work day to day and week to week? If you plan this carefully and do it right, you can prevent a million distracting questions from folks who are not on the project because everyone comes to understand that they will get an update on your work when you have one to share. We got a minimum of intrusive questions during design and development on this project because the product development systems at LaunchDarkly have built-in checks for feedback and iteration. At periodic intervals through the process, we held what we call demo trusts, where key stakeholders review the work that's been done on a project, usually on a functioning branch, so we can demo and test the components live. These demos are intended to get buy-in and feedback from stakeholders at regular intervals, so development teams can iterate at a useful cadence and everyone's kept informed. Using regular planned feedback sessions helped us scope the input we got to the problems that we were really trying to solve and kept the team from getting distracted because someone with the letter C or VP in their job title had a nifty idea. Our process took just over 12 weeks to complete. And when we were done, we launched the new doc site and had an incredible response. This was the really fun part. We launched the site, we had tremendous success and acclaim, the post on our marketing blog received nearly 500 views, and the doc site traffic spiked and has stayed high since then, an increase of between 75 and 85% month to month. And with our easy to use familiar Git-based PR workflow, pull requests and contributions to the docs increased by 350%. These numbers are really exciting, but what actually encouraged me is the community engagement that happened almost immediately before and after our launch. Our first PR on the new doc site came before we'd even announced the launch, barely two hours after we'd set up the redirects and pushed the new site live. Uh, I sent that person some stickers to say thank you. Internally, two different teams, the developer relations team and the support team, each cloned their own version of the doc site repo to start generating internal documentation or writing new user facing content. We got great feedback from strangers in the forms of PRs and feedback from customers and prospects. Our documentation is consistently praised as being useful, comprehensive and easy to navigate. Part of this is because there's a full time technical writer feeling requests and input in near real time. But a lot of it is just because the layout of the docs are easier to read, it's more searchable, and it's just nicer to use. We're also starting to build a community of docs contributors, 40 PRs later, and I'm starting to see the same names appear in our public docs repo. Engineers from LaunchDarkly have had conversations in the PR comments with people from outside the company about how to improve the documentation and suggestions to make the product work better. This is a tremendously exciting development, especially since we didn't do any kind of outreach from the engineering team to possible contributors. We just built the thing and they came to us. We got great feedback internally too from non-docs and non-engineering stakeholders. Before we launched the site, we invited the whole company to do a blitz run of testing against the release candidate, collecting and integrating feedback on bugs, UX opportunities, and the design we finalized long before we shipped the site to the general public. Including the whole company in an effort like this really helped diversify the kind of feedback that we got. It's worth noting that while most of the feedback we got was really positive, not everyone was enamored of our new design. Some people thought the way that we split our visual information architecture out into a top and a sidebar nav was too unfocused to help people find things. That's cool. People are entitled to their opinions. Uniformity is never the goal in a project like this. Consensus was. The key was to have a clearly defined set of objectives going into the project. So when we got feedback that was useful, but out of scope, we could shelve it and prioritize it later. Why later? When all was said and done, I did not want this to be a fire and forget project. I didn't want people to say, oh, well, we rebuilt the doc site, so now it's time to go back to feature work. We had had this tremendously successful launch, and after it was over, we wanted to keep the momentum going. Our traffic on the doc site and the number of internal and external PRs we get has stayed high because of some of the key decisions we used to make the site and the content a constant point of discussion and feedback. This is a model that you can use after you launch your project. After it's over, 
what systems will you use to collect data on the improvements that you've made? Engineers in Stide Launch Darkly stay current with the tool chain and content by submitting their first draft docs as PRs against the site. This has generated suggestions for how to improve the workflow and the components we use every day. I've maintained a confluence document I call Paper Cuts, part of which is pictured in this slide, where I track UX or design feedback I've gotten about the doc site with information about who reported the problem, links to tickets if they exist, and a priority scale from must fix to nice to have to won't fix. This keeps me and the team accountable for making improvements and helps contributors feel like they're not just shouting feedback into the void. And I've continued tracking our site performance in Algolia and Google Analytics to see how our users are responding to what we publish. So what resources, if any, do you have to maintain your project after it ships? How will you fix things that break? Who's formally responsible for helping you solve technical problems when they arise? Ongoing work on the doc site has been assigned to an engineering squad with a dedicated PM and designers. If there's a bug on the site or I have an improvement I want to make, I know what team will work on it and who to talk to about getting it prioritized. So how can you make your ongoing work visible to other contributors and encourage them to continue giving you feedback? Nothing is worse than a project that was awesome a year ago and that everyone has forgotten about now. So I've made myself as accessible as I reasonably can with a docs channel in Slack, a project in Club, Clubhouse, which is our issue tracking software uh, that tracks improvements to the site and upcoming content requirements, and where people can file bugs against the site or the content that are visible to the entire company. I also set up push notifications in Slack where anytime someone says the word docs or documentation or references a docs.launchdarkly.com URL, I get a ping. And now ultimately, what kind of ongoing work will you have to do to make your project continue to grow and improve after it ships? Even if your project is completed and your team disbanded, you might still be able to fit little improvements in here and there if you get creative. For example, I ran a Hack Week project to make larger improvements to the doc site, like designing a better homepage or porting our API docs over to the new site formatting. Okay, that's my talk. I hope by now you have a clearer idea of what a big group can accomplish to improve your documentation. If you need inspiration, follow the questions outlined in the slides to motivate yourself, stay accountable, and do awesome work. Thanks very much for watching.